<laughs> Senator Kyle uh, for his uh, willingness to sit down and uh, try to uh, work this out in a way which uh, is satisfactory to him and to the Foreign Relations Committee. We very much appreciate that. We know what he's after and we believe that there should be consultations uh, and so uh, we're trying to uh, make that happen. I note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. All right. Mr. President. The Senator from Washington. Mr. President, uh, I call up Amendment Number 309. The Senate is in a quorum call. Madam President, uh, Mr. President, I ask you now to the quorum call be uh, withdrawn. Without objection. Mr. President, I call up Amendment Number 3099. Is there objection to setting aside the pending amendment? Without objection, so ordered. The clerk will report the amendment. Senator from Washington, Mrs. Murray proposes an amendment number 3099. At Mr. The President, end. I ask consent that further reading be dispensed with. Without objection. Ms. Mr. President, the amendment that is pending in front of us uh, is is to improve the mental health and suicide prevention services. It is the la language that is derived from our Mental Health Access Act, which was unanimously approved by the Veterans Affairs Committee. Mr. President, this amendment is critical legislation that improves how DOD and VA provide mental health care. I think everyone in this body knows about it, is distressed by this. It's the alarming rate of suicide and mental health problems in our military and veterans populations. We know our service members and veterans have faced unprecedented challenges, multiple deployments, difficulty finding a job here at home, isolation in their communities, and some have faced some very tough times reintegrating into family life with loved ones trying to relate but just not knowing how. These are the challenges that our service members and veterans know all too well. But even today, as they turn to us for help, we're losing the battle. Time and again, we have lost service members and veterans to suicide. While the Departments of Defense and Veterans Affairs have taken very important steps towards addressing this crisis, we know that more does need to be done. We know that any solution depends on reducing wait times and improving access to mental health care. We know that they need to have the proper diagnosis, and we know we need to achieve true coordination of care and information between the Departments of Defense and Veterans Affairs. What this amendment does is require a comprehensive, standardized suicide prevention program across the Department of Defense. It requires the use of best medical practices in suicide prevention and behavioral health programs to address some serious gaps that exist in the current programs. And this amendment expands eligibility for VA mental health services to family members of our veterans. This amendment would also give service members an opportunity to serve as peer counselors to fellow Iraq and Afghanistan veterans and create a quality assurance program for the historically troubled disability evaluation system. It would require the VA to offer peer support services at all medical centers and create opportunities to train more veterans to provide these needed peer services. It will require the VA to establish accurate and reliable measures for mental health services. We must have an effective suicide prevention program in place. It's often only on the brink of crisis that a service member or a veteran seek care. If they are told, sorry, we're too busy to help you, we have lost the opportunity to help them, and to me and to all of us here, that's not acceptable. So I want to thank Senator Levin and Senator McCain for their work on this defense authorization bill and for their help in bringing this amendment to the floor today. Mr. President, I believe that there are no objections to this amendment and that it is that we can, uh, and uh, I hope that we can move it as quickly as possible. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and I would ask unanimous consent to add Senator Baucus as an original co-sponsor. Without objection. Senator from Michigan. Mr. President, I want to commend and thank Senator Murray for her huge effort in this area. It's 
been a her her efforts on behalf of our veterans and our troops has been really instrumental in bringing some of the corrections that are needed to the forefront. And uh, we very much welcome this amendment, and uh, it, it touches uh, issues which are really very much in the minds of uh, most Americans, and that is the mental health care that we provide for our veterans and for our troops. And so I just simply not only support this amendment, but I really want to commend uh, Senator Murray for her leadership and her initiative and uh, I uh, hope and believe it can be vo uh, passed on a voice vote. Is there further debate on the amendment? If not, the question is on amendment number 3099. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. The amendment is agreed to. Move to lay it on the table. Without objection. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Cook.
Mr. President. The Senator from Vermont. Mr. President, I ask that the uh, call of the quorum be dispensed with. Without objection. Mr. President, I know we have um, matters under discussion with the distinguished uh, chairman of the committee and distinguished ranking member, and I've um, discussed with them that while I'm not bringing up an amendment at this point, let me tell, talk about an amendment that I will bring up and expect to pass at some point. Uh, the amendment I will call up at some appropriate point is legislation I've been trying to get enacted for more than three years. It's called the Dale Long Public Safety Officers Benefits Improvement Act. It's legislation that improves uh, Public Safety Officers Benefits Act. That's the federal death and disability program for our nation's first responders who are killed or disabled in the line of duty. And just so senators will, will know, an earlier version of this legislation was adopted here on the Senate floor by voice vote in December uh, 2011. And Madam President, you recall that was just almost exactly a year ago when we brought that up. It was adopted as part of the FAA Air Transportation Modernization and Safety Improvement Act. And then um, during the course of conference negotiations related to FAA legislation, the House Judiciary uh, Chairman Lamar Smith and I negotiated additional measures to be added to the legislation. And our work together produced a package of improvements that contain a modest expansion of benefits for deserving emergency medical responders and a host of reforms to make the Public Safety Officers Benefits Program stronger and more effective, more cost efficient. The legislation will become one of the cornerstones of the partnership we have between the federal government and our first responders will make that partnership even stronger. In fact, the reforms that Chairman Smith and I developed in consultation with the Department of Justice and the first responder community completely offset the eliminated increase in spending. Unfortunately, at that time, due to an error made by the Congressional Budget Office, the matter was dropped from the FAA conference report. CBO, to their credit, later corrected their error. They provided an official cost estimate that makes clear this legislation will result in no new federal spending. And uh, Madam President, I ask uh, consent that that letter be made part of the record. Without objection, so ordered. But despite our, our setback, Chairman Smith and I were, were and we remain determined to move forward. I know how I have his full support for inclusion in this measure, the defense authorization measure we now consider. And I greatly appreciate the efforts he made in a bipartisan manner to get this done. In fact, this legislation containing this amendment was passed uh, in the House of Representatives in June of this year by a voice vote unanimously done. Now, I know a lot of senators on both sides of the aisle care about reforming government programs, making the federal government work better. Well, this is a bipartisan measure that does that. It'll speed up claims processing. It'll reduce costs for the Department of Justice. It'll lessen unnecessary paperwork burdens for claimants. It has passed, as I said, with overwhelming Democratic and Republican support in the House. It solved the pass over, I think, misguided objections. Some might say this is not the responsibility of Congress. Well, as a constitutional matter, that's simply not true. It's a matter of policy. Since 1976, Congress has made the judgment that it's the right thing to do to take care of surviving spouses and children of police officers, firefighters, emergency medical responders who are killed in the uh, line of duty. 
Congress has always provided assistance to these heroes. Now, if there's a senator who believes this is beyond the responsibility of Congress, we'll introduce and defend legislation to repeal the policy we found in 1976. Americans take care of each other. Live by the idea we take care of our own, just the federal government is working hard to help those suffering from Hurricane Sandy, or as the federal government provides critical assistance to people, communities devastated by tornadoes or drought or wildfires. Just as Congress stood by the families of those killed in the attacks of September 11, 2001, we take care of our own. We always will. So, Madam President, as I said at some appropriate time, I will call up the amendment. In the meantime, I ask my full statement and the letter I referred to be made part of the record. Without objection, so ordered. And, Madam President, I've, um, I ask unanimous consent that Patricia Clough, a fellow in Senator Warner's office, be granted privileges to the floor during consideration of Treaty Document 1112-7 and S3254. Without objection, so ordered. And Madam President, I ask unanimous consent that David Yurick, a defense fellow in Senator Blumenthal's office, be granted four privileges for the duration of the debate in the National Defense Authorization Act for FY 2013. Without objection, so ordered. And Madam President, I suggest the absence of quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Okaka.
Up next, Eli Saslow reports on the letters that are sent to President Obama from the American...
The senator from Vermont is recognized. Um, Madam President, I would uh, ask to speak as of in morning business. Uh, the Senate is in a quorum call. I would ask that the quorum call be vitiated. Without objection, so ordered. Vermont, yes. Uh, I understand that the senator is going to take about 10 minutes, is that correct? 10 minutes, two hours, somewhere in that vicinity. And then the senator from Rhode Island is going to take approximately 10 minutes, is that correct? I would like to be recognized at the conclusion of the senator from Vermont's remarks for about 10 minutes. As though in morning business? As though in morning business. I would ask consent that the two senators be recognized for uh, 10 minutes each, as though in morning business. Without objection, so ordered. Um, Madam President, um, sometimes there is no end to arrogance. Uh, I find it literally beyond comprehension that we have folks from Wall Street who received huge bailouts from the people of our country, from working families in this country, because of the greed and recklessness and illegal behavior which Wall Street did to drive us into this recession. And now these very same people are coming here to Congress to lecture us and the American people about how we have to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid while they enjoy huge salaries and retirement benefits. Lloyd Blankfein is the CEO of Goldman Sachs. In 2006 and 2007, he was the highest priced, highest paid executive on Wall Street, making over $125 million in total compensation. My understanding is that he has wealth of hundreds of millions of dollars. He, as a leader in Goldman Sachs, received $278 million refund, Goldman Sachs did from the IRS, in 2008, even though it made a profit of $2.3 billion. During the financial crisis, Goldman Sachs received a total of $814 billion in virtually zero interest loans from the Federal Reserve and $10 billion bailout from the Treasury Department. This is the CEO of Goldman Sachs. And now, with his huge wealth, he is coming here to Washington to lecture the American people on how we have got to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid for tens of millions of Americans who are struggling now to keep their heads above water. And this is what a statement was that he recently made. Quote, I believe he was on a TV show. 
Lloyd Blankfein, you're going to have to undoubtedly do something to lower people's expectations. Lower people's expectations. The entitlements and what people think they're going to get because they're not going to get it. Social Security wasn't devised to be a system that supported you for a 30-year retirement after a 25-year career. So there will be certain things like the retirement age will have to be changed. Maybe the benefits will have to be affected. Maybe some of the inflation adjustments will have to be revised. But in general, entitlements have to be slowed down and contained, end of quote. This comes from a man worth hundreds of millions of dollars whose company, along with the rest of the companies on Wall Street, drove this country into the recession that it is in, which, by the way, contributed to the deficit that we're in. He is coming to Capitol Hill to lecture us and lecture the working families of this country on how we have to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Arrogance, I think, has no end. That people from Wall Street can come down here and tell us that. Now, Madam President, I think most Americans understand that the reason we are in the terrible recession that we're in right now, and the reason that we went from a $236 billion surplus when Bill Clinton left office, has everything in the world to do, not with Social Security, but has everything in the world to do with the fact that we went into the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan forgot to pay for them. We gave huge tax breaks to people like Mr. Blankfein and didn't offset it. Passed the Medicare Part D prescription drug program not paid for. And as a result of the Wall Street recession, significantly less revenue is now coming in to the federal government. That is why we went from a $236 billion surplus in 2001 to a trillion dollar deficit today. Now, the deficit is, in fact, a serious issue, and it has got to be addressed, but it has got to be addressed not in the way that Mr. Blankfein and Pete Peterson and the other Wall Street billionaires want us to address the deficit, but in a way that is fair to working people. And among other things, we have got to protect Social Security, protect Medicare, protect Medicaid. Now, I was... Uh, appreciative uh, that the other day I read that the White House has said something that many of us have wanted them to say, is that Social Security had nothing to do with the deficit. Social Security should be treated separately. And I think that is a real step forward. Many of us signed a letter to that effect. But what does worry me, uh, Madam President, uh, is this issue of chain CPI. And I want everybody to understand that what the chain CPI is about, nobody outside of Capitol Hill knows what it's about, but what it's about is reformulating how we determine COLAs. And if this chain CPI was passed, what it would mean is if somebody is 65 now, this goes into effect immediately if it were passed, by the time they are 75, there would be a $560 a year reduction in what they otherwise would have gotten in Social Security benefits through the COLAs. And by the time they're 85, it will be $1,000 a year. We must defeat any and all efforts to impose a change CPI, not only on Social Security uh, beneficiaries, but also it would apply, if you can believe this, on disabled veterans. Does Mr. Blankfein and his other CEO's friends on Wall Street really want us to balance the budget on the backs of disabled vets? Well, this senator surely is not going to support that. Madam President, there are ways to do deficit reduction which are fair. Everybody has got to understand that we have already cut approximately $1 trillion in benefits already. So when we talk about $4 trillion in deficit reduction, $1 trillion has already taken place. Second of all, obviously, at a time when the wealthiest people are doing phenomenally well, when we have growing wealth and income inequality in America, of course we have to repeal Bush's tax breaks for people making $250,000 a year or more. That's another trillion dollars. 
We have got to appreciate the fact that one out of four corporations in America doesn't pay a nickel in taxes. We can bring in significant amounts of revenue through tax reform, which asks corporations to start paying their fair share of taxes. We're losing $100 billion a year because corporations of the wealthy are stashing their money in the Cayman Islands and other tax havens, bringing substantial revenue. Defense spending has tripled since 1997. We're now spending almost as much as the rest of the world combined. Let's take a serious look at defense spending. Madam President, you do that and you make some efficiencies in Medicare and Medicaid, make them more efficient, not cut benefits, you can move toward serious deficit reduction without cutting Social Security, without cutting Medicare, without cutting Medicaid. Now, we just had an election a few years ago, a few weeks ago, November 6th, and what the American people, I think, said is that the time is now for the wealthy to start paying their fair share of taxes. We have seen poll after poll after poll, including from some very conservative people, who are saying do not cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. I think it is time for the United States Senate and the Congress to start listening to the American people. Let us go forward with deficit reduction, but let us not do it on the backs of the elderly, the children, the sick, or the poor. And with that, Madam President, I would yield the floor. Madam President.